All right, today is the day, and we have here the front upper control arm of the Airtay supercar. Now, between the two of them, it took about 38 hours of work. Now, that's partly due to the fact that I had to rebuild or redesign this part. The old version, when I was pressing the ball joint in, it kind of distorted it, and rather than building a jig and things to make that other one work, we just redesigned it and built this one here. Now, it's possible this one will also have to be rebuilt, and in fact, almost every part of this car is subject to that same possibility of having to be replaced. Well, let's jump into looking at how we built this part. And while we're doing that, we can talk more about the good and the bads of having to build your own components and whether you would want to or not as well. Anyway, let's jump in. I think most of the fabrication in this video is going to be pretty straightforward. So while you watch, let me talk to you about the idea of building all the components yourself. I get a lot of comments, people saying they want to do the same thing that I'm doing. And I tend to steer them away from going to this depth. And I recommend using a donor car or at the very least developing a chassis that uses existing running gear. Just taking those steps is going to save you several thousand hours. As I mentioned in the introduction, designing and building these parts is experimental at best. With all the components being hand built, there's an almost guarantee that something's going to fail, crack, buckle, or cause some serious vibrations. The downers out there try to tell me that this will be a death trap and unroadworthy, but somehow their imagination is bigger than the reality. And they don't stop to think, oh, he can drive it at 20 miles an hour, then take it up to 40 and then on to 60. And all this, of course, with frequent inspections. Well, believe me, the most dangerous part of driving this car is going to be watching out for the other drivers that are gawking at you and not paying attention. But I digress. What I'm saying is that if it's your first time building a custom car or you want to get something on the road in a reasonably time, simplify your project. If on the other hand, you want to test your skill set, try something new or be able to say, I built every square inch or millimeter of it for you in Europe, or other parts of the world by all means go all out and for heaven's sake if you're going to go all out take the trouble of building from the ground up design something cool do not build a replica if you want to make it look kind of like your favorite car maybe you could do that just don't build a replica that's what kit cars are for or desktop models anyway that's my two cents worth of what you should try to do when you're working on building every component of the car, if you're gonna go that far, or how you could simplify your life. Anyway, on with this building of this upper A-arm. As you can see, this has been pretty simple by just the matter of uh, sandwiching a couple of pieces of metal that have been uh, cut out with a water jet and tack welding all those pieces together, and then going back and seam welding it. You'll notice there is a ring in the center for the ball joint that has been machined out to accept that. And that's also welded in place. And on the ends are these little pieces of tubing that have also been machined through the center to accept some urethane bushings. Go through it on the car where the pickup points have been placed to make sure I have it spaced apart correctly. And then take it to the workbench and stick this heavy bar in there. That's going to keep it all straight, nice and square while I tack weld it. With a tack welded, then of course a nice fillet bead right around to tie those pieces in nice and tight. I will spare you the grinding and sanding to make these things pretty, but we will show you the pretty of making the powder coat. Now powder coating is a pretty simple process and pretty inexpensive to get into if you want to. The only thing that you think might be expensive is an oven. And I've just taken an old oven that was broken down, the circuit board in it was no good, and just bought a little cheap PID PID controller to make it work. So now get those parts in that oven without knocking the powder off. Of course, is always a trick when you're working with a tiny space. But that's all I do with small components. Anything larger I, get a, I will send off to somebody else to do. But we get these things in the oven. We'll fire this thing up and get that thing baked. Nice coating on it. And with a nice coating, we're ready to start assembling this thing. Another great tool if you have to do this kind of thing is a 20 ton press. And if you get one of these presses, start saving every piece of uh, scrap metal you have that's round and got a hole in it. Will always be good to uh, make spacers and bushings to 
set up jigs to press things in. With the ball joint in, go ahead and throw the snap ring on there. That keeps it from ever coming loose if it should come loose after the press fit. And they each are equipped with a little zerk fitting, put grease in it. We will actually grease these things on the final assembly after we have everything painted and put together in that last assembly. I said these uh, tubes on the end are also machined out to be a good nice press fit for these bushings. You don't want the bushing itself to turn in there. You want the surface of that little uh, galvanized pin that's going to go inside to be the grease side. We'll grease it of course on that final assembly as well. One of these is fighting me a little bit. Throw a clamp on there, see if we can squeeze it in, put a little pressure on it. We uh, put a few more wax on it. And with those in, we can slide it into our pickup points and throw some bolts in there. Now, of course, again, this is always just a test fit. And this has all been waited on by me to get to this point because there are no lower pickup points. I've been waiting to get this upper control arm finished. And now with it finished, I have a good method to align and make sure my bottom arm is fit in the right position. Now these adjustments here for the king plin inclination will get those spaced out just right. And they should be sitting just over that top bar of that front subframe. They can be adjusted in and out, but we're going to get this thing as close as we can. We'll actually be putting on the pickup point bracket today, but we're going to just put it on where it should be just to check and see if things are correct. The other thing we want to make sure is the caster angle. And there should be a little bit difference. The top A arm should be back about 0.35 inches or 9 millimeters. I'm going to throw a plumb bob on there just to kind of see if we're close. So between there and yep, the bottom one's forward about three and in, point three inches.